They are supporting terrorists, the YPG, the PYD, including ISIL. It's very clear we have evidence. Turkey's leader claims he has confirmed evidence that Washington is supporting Islamic State in Syria. We look at America's reaction. The EU security flaws are being heavily scrutinized as an investigation continues into how the attacker in the Berlin market massacre managed to escape across two borders to Italy during a Europe-wide manhunt. And Denmark is appalled at revelations that its citizens who fled to join Islamic State in Syria still received 90,000 euros in welfare benefits. Hello, it's midday here in Moscow. My name's Colin Bray. Thanks for choosing us to update you on what's happening around the world this hour. First for you, Turkey's leader is accusing Washington and its allies of supporting terrorist groups in Syria. Artis Kalamopan has been following U.S.-Turkey relations after President Erdogan made these allegations while speaking to reporters in Ankara on Tuesday. At the beginning, the coalition said they were going to fight ISIL. They even accused us of supporting ISIL. Now they have all disappeared. On the contrary, they are supporting terrorists, the YPG, the PYD, including ISIL. It's very clear we have evidence, with photos and video. The State Department has commented on the statements from Erewhon and that their, their comments seem to be a little bit contrary to what was actually said by the Turkish head of state. <laughs> I mean, it's ludicrous, to be honest. You know what we're doing in terms of the coalition. And in fact, we're working uh, constructively with Turkey, you know, to, to lead those efforts. Uh, Turkey's a NATO ally, a strong partner in the NA. A dash coalition. Despite the fact that U.S. leaders say that these allegations are, are ludicrous, uh, they maintain that Turkey and the United States still have a very good relationship and that they're still working together in alliance in the region. Now, these are not the first uh, rather hostile words that have come from Turkey over the last few days. Um, in the last couple days, we've heard allegations that, that the United States is not supporting Turkey in Gerabolus and other areas in their operations against terrorism. Furthermore, this is actually not the first time that Erdogan has accused U.S. leaders of supporting terrorism. Hey, America. Oh, America, I told you many times, you either side with us or terrorist organizations. You didn't have a good grasp on them. And that's why the region has turned into a sea of blood. Now, on those previous occasions, Erdogan was referring to Kurdish forces that he considers to be terrorists. Now, on this occasion, he did name ISIL as being supported by the United States as well. Despite harsh words from Turkey, U.S. officials just continue their mantra that Turkey is an ally in the region. The United States... Uh, as a friend and partner of Turkey. Turkey's been a strong ally for decades. We believe uh, Turkey's a genuine partner in destroying ISIL. Now, it's important to place these recent comments in their proper context. Just recently, there was a meeting in Russia between the foreign ministers of Russia, Turkey, and Iran. They met, their foreign ministers met, and there's speculation of a, of a kind of new coalition possibly being formed regarding Syria. And that the United States was not present at this meeting, at this high-level meeting regarding the situation in Syria, specifically the city of Aleppo. So there's talk of the United States possibly being sidelined, of Turkey, Iran, and Russia coming together, maybe a new coalition being formed. Nothing is exactly clear yet and it's really unclear exactly what the comments from Erdogan what they will mean for the unity of, of the coalition against ISIL terrorism that currently exists. Callum open there well separately RT's been speaking exclusively with Iran's defense minister who suggested that the US is not fully committed to defeating terrorists in Syria. We have never coordinated our operations with the Americans and we will never collaborate with them. The Western coalition is only fighting there in name. They have no real intention of fighting a war in either Syria or Iraq. Let's not forget how they bombed the Syrian army at Deir ez Zor. We don't see any real willingness on their part to play a truly meaningful role in fighting Islamic State. They are the ones who have raised these terrorists in the first place, so all they want to do is keep them safe. Well, the Iranians uh, have very good reason to believe that the United States has never been serious in fighting against the terrorists because its allies, we know, and it's very quite open, 
that uh, their regional allies, again, are supporting al-Qaeda. And the United States is supporting groups that are aligned with al-Qaeda. And al-Qaeda and ISIS are really no different from one another. Therefore, the United States has not been sincere at all. I think the United States is uh, really, really is, is uh, leading from behind once again, unless uh, the Trump administration lives up to its promise to work with and coordinate with uh, both um, uh, Russia and, and Syria and Turkey to do away with ISIS. But, and, and it's very disingenuous, on the other hand, of uh, President Erdogan to all of a sudden receive an epiphany uh, that uh, the United States is fighting ISIS when it's been a known fact for quite some time. And this goes back to two th at least 2012 uh, when, when uh, we were uh, supporting all the Sunnis, including ISIS elements, to topple President Assad. Statement came just a day after Russian soldiers in Syria discovered a mass grave on school premises in part of Aleppo that was held by the militants until recently. Please be warned that some of the video that we're about to show you, you might find upsetting. Now, according to the Russian Defense Ministry, most of the victims, and they include children, were shot in the head. Many were found with body parts missing. Russia's military also says that the victims were subjected to torture before being killed. The rebels also booby-trapped many areas before leaving, with large weapons dumps also being found. As Murat Gazdiev now explains. When the rebels were forced out of eastern Aleppo, when it was retaken, liberated by the Syrian uh, government, as they say, the rebels left behind plenty of surprises, and unfortunately none of them pleasant. The mines, for example, thousands of improvised explosive uh, devices, booby traps. Uh, now we have, we're at a point where a dozen people, up to a dozen people are dying every day to these mines. These are civilians coming back home, you know, finding uh, their apartments mined. Uh, this is in streets and various buildings and offices and basements and it is taking a toll the other surprise with you know the mines being cleared the other surprise is the mass graves that russian and uh, syrian sappers have uh, stumbled upon and uh, they found in these mass graves according to the russian military now dozens of bodies and all of those bodies either showing uh, gunshot wounds to the head or signs of mutilation signs uh, of torture Apparently, Nusra Front, uh, Al-Qaeda in Syria, and its affiliated rebel groups aren't big fans of the Geneva Conventions. They uh, have been torturing dissidents, torturing anyone they suspect of uh, supporting Assad, uh, or even their relatives. Now, we've contacted uh, the UN, we've contacted various other humanitarian uh, groups, such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, uh, the usual lot. And uh, strangely enough, uh, they've been silent. Aside from the UN, we haven't heard anything from them. When a crime, when an atrocity is reported to have been committed by Assad, they're all over it. The Syrian government, the Syrian uh, military, especially if you have the Russian Air Force involved, they're all over it. They'll come out with details, they'll send press releases to the press. When the roles are reversed, and it's the rebels that are suspected of committing an atrocity, of killing someone, uh, of doing something wrong. Well, you've got, to, you've got to knock on their door and you've got to keep on knocking. Because just recently we uh, contacted all of these human rights groups about, for example, the shelling by rebels on Aleppo. I was there, I filmed it daily, you know, kids uh, torn to pieces. This was happening almost every day. They didn't care where they shot, the universities, schools, uh, residential areas contacted them about that. We had to keep writing and writing until we got a vague condemnation. Nevertheless, these are mass graves with civilians showing signs of mutilation, of gunshot wounds to the head, execution. Children's corpses there as well, according to the Russian military. So you've got to wonder, you know, just how, uh, just how balanced humanitarian groups are being in the case of Aleppo. While there's still a lot to uncover from the districts of Aleppo previously held by the rebels, civilians in the Syrian capital are struggling with a water supply crisis. That's because militants control the region's main source. Correspondent Lizzie Phelan will have more on that a little bit later in the program. There are claims that the Berlin market attacker managed to pass through France to Italy despite several reported sightings, as witnesses claim they came face to face with the terrorist. It took EU authorities four days to hunt the fugitive down. Italian police have released an image of the attacker outside Milan Central Station just hours before he was fatally shot by officers. 
Investigators are still trying to establish how he escaped Berlin after killing 12 people and injuring almost 50 others before slipping out of the country and then through France. Emily Sue looks at the escape route it's thought he took. For four days, he was branded Europe's most wanted and most dangerous man. After he plowed through a Berlin Christmas market with a 25-ton truck, killing 12 and injuring 48 others on December 19th. Not only did it take four days for police to find Anis Amri, he was found a thousand kilometers away from the crime scene, all the way in Milan. The question is, how did Europe's most wanted man manage to escape the authorities within Europe itself? Well, in newly obtained surveillance footage, it's been confirmed that Amri made a stay at Lyon's train station. There, he bought a train ticket to the city of Chambéry. France's railway company then confirmed that he did indeed have a ticket from Chambéry to the Italian city of Torino. Now, Italian authorities have yet to comment on this, but we know that he eventually made his way to the Sesto San Giovanni train station, where he was shot dead by police after he opened fire. We asked the German police about Amri's movements across Europe, but they refused to comment. But one thing's for sure, that a terror attack suspect managed to cross three European countries, Germany, Italy and France, without being detected even once. I think it's always been incredibly difficult to police people travelling across Europe. France has been under a state of emergency since the Bataclan shootings um, over a year ago now. But you would think it would be more difficult for someone to travel through that country, but manifestly it is not. And what happened with Amri is not an isolated case. Following the 2015 Paris Bataclan theatre attack, the main suspect, Salah Abdussalam, also got away, driving to Brussels and passing at least three police checkpoints with no problems at all. Abdussalam was in hiding for four months before he was caught. Well, certainly the um, Abdul Salam case was uh, quite shocking, the fact he'd get through three checkpoints, which rather goes to prove the point that even if you have these checkpoints at borders, people will slip through, there will be human error, people can change their appearance, um, people can have fake ID. I mean, it's been reported that Amri had uh, multiple different ID. To bring the point home, one man even made a video of himself crossing the Danish-German border wearing a mask and waving an Islamic State flag to show how open Europe's internal borders are. Looks like Europe may just not be as safe as it once was. Emily Sue reporting. Well, we've talked exclusively to the youth wing leader from the Alternative for Germany party, who says the attack is a result of Chancellor Merkel's open border policy. This guy was an asylum seeker. Um, he was known as a treat for the government. He was already in jail, but not deported. So um, that's the result of Angela Merkel's open door policy. In German, she say all the time, wir schaffen das, we will do this, we will do this. Mm. Now it's time for a change in her policy, and she should admit that she failed. It was, in the beginning, a good idea, you know. It's easy to travel inside of Europe, it's good for young people to explore Europe. But now we have this mass migration, we have open borders. A Europe without borders leads to borderless crime. And now we can see what happened. People feel not any longer safe, and they're, and they're looking for an alternative. If you criticize the politics of Angela Merkel, the refugee politic, uh, policy, um, they will start to call you fascist or something like this. I guess we're sick of this political correctness in whole Europe. Outgoing U.S. President Barack Obama has claimed that if he'd been legally able to run for a third term, that he would have been backed by the majority of voters and beaten Donald Trump. I'm confident that if I, if I had run again and articulated it, I think I could have mobilized a majority of the American people to rally behind it. Well, his successor, Donald Trump, took to Twitter to reject the idea that he would have lost, saying his success came from Democrat failures during Obama's time in office. Miguel Francis Santiago takes a look back at the outgoing president's record sheet. So Obama is confident he could have won this election. That's quite a statement from someone whose party lost its mojo. No, seriously, 2016 has become the worst year for the Democrats in almost a century. From when Obama took office in 2008 through 2016 elections, Democrats have lost 63 seats in the House, 11 seats in the Senate, 13 governorships, and nearly 1,000 seats in state legislatures. This is the lowest they've got since the 1920s, and even the Democrats themselves admit they lack strategy or a plan. 
How many seats do we have to lose before we make a change? We're not even a national party at this point. Uh, I think Obama may have lost even worse than Hillary in the election here. American people were, were kind of fed up with Obama policies. Uh, Hillary was associated with those policies, but they were Obama's policies, and I think the uh, voters would have turned against him as well. Perhaps Obama is an ideal Republican candidate. Take military campaigns. Obama's led the country through a continuous state of war for the last eight years, which is more than any of the previous presidents in the last quarter of a century. And in a typical Republican tradition, Obama promotes mass surveillance and writes off whistleblowers as traitors. And of course, his hawkish stance on Russia has gotten the relationship between the two superpowers to an all-time low. It's no wonder why he likes mentioning Reagan when it comes to Russia. There, there was a survey, some of you saw, where 37% of Republican voters <laughs> approve of Putin. Over a third of Republican voters, Ronald Reagan would roll over in his grave. So let's recap. Obama said that he could have mobilized a lot of people if he was to run in 2016. Well, he already tried mobilizing people for Hillary, and he failed, even among the black voters. I will consider it a personal insult, an insult to my legacy, if this community lets down its guard and fails to activate itself in this election. You want to give me a good send-off? Go vote! Perhaps the outgoing president should join the Republican Party and work on making it more, well, to his Republican standards, because it looks like he failed the Democrats. Miguel Francis Santiago, RT. Danish taxpayers have been shocked to learn that they've been inadvertently funding jihadists fighting for ISIL in Syria. We'll tell you how after the break. I'm Tom Harpin, and I'll give you what the mainstream media can't, the big picture. We'll go deeper, investigate, and debate, all so you can get the big picture. People with stories to tell. Those who deserve to be heard. Studied inside out. But still with unrevealed secrets. Leaders, politicians, thinkers, and witnesses. They're here to speak. Are you there to hear? The year 2016 was tumultuous, even transformational. On this edition of Crosstalk, we discuss what made this year memorable and what to expect in the new year. Revelations that Denmark's welfare system has been lining the pockets of jihadists fighting in Syria has led to the employment minister there vowing to take action. It's after Denmark's security service reported that 36 individuals left the country to join Islamic State in Syria. And despite being out of the country, they still received more than 90,000 euros in unemployment benefits. Uh, even though seven individuals were reportedly killed in action, their funding from Danish councils continued. It is totally unacceptable and a disgrace. It must be stopped. If you travel to Syria to participate in war, to become an ISIS fighter, then you obviously do not have any right to benefits from the government. Denmark isn't the first country to discover its benefit systems being manipulated by terrorists. Britain, of course, found evidence that its social welfare had funded the jihadists suspected of carrying out the terror attacks in Paris and Brussels. As for the fallout in Denmark, we spoke to the leader of the Party of the Danes, who says the problem goes far wider. What we are seeing right now is funding of terrorism. The, the state is funding terrorism, and it is not only sponsoring uh, terrorism in, in Syria. Blood have been shed, uh, let alone the last year, in the streets of Berlin, Brussels and Paris. And uh, a little more than a year ago, it also happened in Copenhagen with, uh, with terrorism. I could continue with this, but uh, the fact is that the, the elites ignore this fact. 
Now back to Syria, where residents in the capital are struggling to cope with a water supply crisis. That's because militants control the region's main source. Lizzie Phelan has the details. Damascus is one of the safest places in Warsaw in Syria, but rebel forces have a powerful resource that they've used in the past: water. The Ain al Fiji Spring, under rebel control, supplies around 65% of the city's water needs. Last week, the government accused rebels of contaminating the water supply with diesel and poison after they rejected a deal that would have seen them leave the area. The government shut off the supply before it could reach the capital. But even UN staff are alarmed, as this leaked internal memo warning them not to use tap water shows. The apartment block where we live has had no water supply. I came here to carry water back in this truck because so many people don't have any, and I want to help them. The terrorists cut off the water supply. This is becoming a common scene in the streets of Damascus. People coming with as many jerry cans as they can fit in the back of their car to fill them up from these trucks carrying water from underground reserves. Damascus now has been without water from the main supply for five days, and if it doesn't resume soon, then this is going to become the new norm here. Western media have reported claims that the government bombed Ain al Fiji during their current offensive as the reason for water stopping in the capital. In the past, rebels have disrupted the water supply to Damascus to try and pressure the government to accept their demands. Again, in the wake of the latest failed negotiations a few days ago, they released this video, threatening to blow up Damascus's water tunnels. Here at the local water authority, people can collect water for free, finding some relief from extortionate prices by local stores. We had no water for five days. Now we've found this place, and the government is helping us. It's been very tough, but thank God, in the past two days, things have become easier. Just as the city has become safer over the last year, in the wake of the mass surrender by rebels from the capital's neighborhoods, this new water crisis is a reminder to Damascus that while the war continues to rage outside the city, life here is still fragile and uncertain. Lizzie Phelan, Damascus, RT. Divers have found the flight data recorder from the Russian military plane crash site in the Black Sea. The disaster killed all 92 people on board. 15 bodies have also been recovered. These are underwater images of the divers searching around the debris. The aircraft was travelling to Syria from Moscow, but crashed soon after takeoff from Russia's Black Sea resort of Sochi early on Sunday, where it was refueling. Among those on the aircraft were journalists, service personnel. And musicians from the world-renowned Alexandrov Ensemble, the Russian Armed Forces' official choir. They were due to celebrate New Year's Eve with Russia's air force in Syria. Next, during the usually quiet holiday season, President Obama has been busy approving legislation which will see a significant change to America's International Broadcasting and Media Board, known as the BBG. The move was included in a defense spending bill for 2017, despite being a non-military body. Critics are warning that the move could jeopardize journalists' independence. The law will see an overhaul to the Broadcasting Board of Governors. It's the agency that oversees media operations such as Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. Instead of the current structure, an advisory board will be appointed with no decision-making powers. Instead, those powers will be placed in the hands of a CEO appointed directly by the White House. We got reaction from American media analyst Lionel about the BBG's restructuring. What this is is, in addition to the NDAA of 2012, is to remove the prohibition against external foreign propaganda, which nobody really cared about, and it internalizes it and directs it here. This is scary business here. But understand, let's go back again to Harry Truman's time. 
you know the biggest problem they had with having the State I'll Department decide what was propaganda? And the reason why it was absolutely verboten for there to be any kind of directed propaganda? Nobody believed the State Department. They, they said that we're not going to have somebody in the State Department determine what? What is and is isn't the truth? Look around the world. Countries are doing it. Remember, Europe, the UK, that's a beta test for this. You're going to see legislation. You're going to see UN charters. You're going to have all kinds of, of people clamoring for this. And that fear of perceived propaganda or fake news has spread to Europe. In Germany, there are concerns that its 2017 parliamentary vote will be undermined, as Peter Oliver explains. We saw it in the United States. Fake news. 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 Now, fake news from Russia is being touted as the biggest threat to the 2017 Bundestag election in Germany. We are having to deal to some extent with information coming out of Russia as well as cyber attacks originating from Russia. Coping with this is an everyday task for us. Over the last couple of months, Germany's security bigwigs have been preparing us. There is growing evidence of attempts to influence the Bundestag election in the coming year. We expect a further increase in cyber attacks in the run-up to the election. In fact, Germany is so concerned about fake news, the 2017 will see the establishment of the country's own defence centre against disinformation. Nothing at all, like Orwell's Ministry of Truth. Interior Minister Thomas de Maizière wants it set up without delay. Critics of the move say that this is Angela Merkel's government getting their blame game out ahead of potential losses in next year's vote. They're blaming basically two institutions on uh, two, two factors. The first one is AFD, the alternative for Germany. And secondly is of course Russia. The established parties are under heavy attack and fire from, from the populations, from mistakes they have done. Of course they are blaming uh, an external foe. Over one million refugees and migrants have come to Germany since 2015. Angela Merkel's refusal to abandon her open-door policy has led to growing demonstrations demanding that she step down. And as concerns over terrorism, which became ever more real last week after the attack on a Christmas market which killed 12, her government's ability to keep people safe is coming into question. But the biggest worry, of course, is Russian influence in the media. While some within Angela Merkel's party continue to fixate on so-called fake news or Russian propaganda, those that sit in the Bundestag after next year's general election will have been those politicians that listened to the concerns of the German people. Peter Oliver, RT, Berlin. Going undergrounds next with a chilling warning that America and China are on an inescapable road to war.